All right, testing, testing. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Uh, welcome to the Game Dev Cafe. My name is Karina. Today we are interviewing someone who I have actually heard speak on several occasions, um, and I'm really happy that we were able to book an interview with him today. Uh, Philippe Morin, he's from Red Barrels, which you probably know as the studio behind Outlast, although they do a lot of stuff, and we'll, we'll certainly ask Philippe directly about that today. Um, give me one second, and I will make sure that you're able to see us on screen here. So I just realized that I have the... <laughs> The promo still running, which is no good. Uh, Philippe, there we go. Now we can actually see you. Welcome. <laughs> How are you? Well, I'm good and you. Wonderful. Uh, we're actually enjoying a little bit of warmer weather right now. Usually weather is the first thing I talk about with my game devs because we, <laughs> we interview people all over the world. So, um, you know, I'm from Toronto. Usually we're talking to people someplace warmer. Um, how's the weather down there? <laughs> uh, it's a little bit warmer. Uh, it was <laughs> went down like minus 20 uh, last week. Uh, uh, with the with the wind with like minus thirty. So, yeah, uh, <laughs> that's pretty much what we had up here or over here. I guess is technically more accurate. Um, but yeah, I'm glad that you're seated in a comfortable studio. We're really excited to be talking to you today. Um, I know that we originally um, sort of heard from you at CGX, and we had a lot of requests after that talk to, um, I guess, get to know you a little bit better, um, understand Red Rails, and I understand you're the co-founder of that studio as well. Um, and I guess just understand sort of what you do in your role there. Um, it's sort of a, a large role, not just co-founder, but senior game designer. Um, I guess, you know, for the benefit of myself and anyone who may not know, what, what does that role sort of entail? Is that, um, you know, is that exactly what it seems to be? Or are there a lot of strange aspects that people don't quite understand? <laughs> well, you know, when, when you start a, a new uh, studio, new indie studio, there's a lot of... Oh, I think we got cut off you. there. Sorry about that. And <laughs> no, sorry no for those watching. All right, so hold on. Let's give uh, us a chance to reset. For some reason, I don't have you on camera anymore. Um, oh, the joys of Twitch streaming. <laughs> All right, give me one second here. I'm going to see if I can get you back. There we go. Yay, back on camera for no apparent reason. <laughs> if you're watching on Twitch again, this is sort of like one of the joys of doing this, but... Um, Philippe, sorry to cut you off. So I had asked, um, just to recap, uh, what does your role sort of entail? Because I imagine that there's a lot that people understand is involved in senior game design and a lot that people probably have no idea goes into your work. <laughs> well, as a game designer in, in a uh, indie studio, you have to wear a lot of, hat, a lot of different hats. Mm -hmm. uh, but traditionally, as a game designer, you come up with the, the general concept and idea I mean, we don't have anybody here who's actually like a creative director. You know, we okay. kind of all work together uh, uh, as a team. Uh, but, uh, you know, coming up with the concept, the rules, uh, the world, the setting, uh, main characters, work with a script writer on the story. Uh, and, you know, because we are a small team, then uh, in our case, we also do level design. So we don't really have right. a difference between game design and level designer designers just do it all right and uh and also because you know we're a small indie studio then i uh, end up being the one responsible for all the uh, paperwork and business stuff uh, uh the fun part we just hired, <laughs> yes yes we just hired a, a brand new office manager i'm uh, super excited about that oh, so congrats I'll be, I'll be able to uh, spend a little bit more time uh, in unreal uh, working on the game <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, that's and I find that that's the goal of a lot of people who are at smaller studios. It's to somehow hire people into all these extra roles so that they can focus on whatever their core title may be. Uh, <laughs> I guess um, <laughs> senior game design also is something that, um, you know, I imagine touches many different aspects of the game, um, given that it's, you know, sort of a higher level role. So do you tend to work with everyone at your studio or are you working with a, with a smaller team within Red Barrels? Um, you know, what sort of your, your work um, relationship well, the, like? The size of our team is uh, so small that, uh, you know, it's, it's, we work, everybody works with everybody. Okay. Uh, the first Outlast, we should, the first Outlast, we were uh, only 10 people. Uh, wow. The second Outlast, we uh, got up to 20. Uh, but it's still, you know, 20 people, you know, you, everybody has to talk to, some, to, to, uh, <laughs> to everybody at some point. So uh, That's uh, fair. there's no real 
there's no real uh, concept of department. Uh, uh, but uh, I mean, sometimes it kind of makes sense when you uh, you're tackling uh, planning and all, stuff like that. But uh, otherwise, no, it's just like one. And it, yeah, everybody works with everybody, and everybody is uh, uh, share with uh, with people from other departments. Uh, so you know, it's not just about the you know this is what your job is and this is what you focus on and you don't care about everything else. Uh, <laughs> we try to uh, uh, to have people uh, you know, work on a game as game developers, not so much as, you know, as an animator or as a programmer. Ah, oh, interesting. So it's very holistic then, I guess, and, and by necessity, but also I guess by design as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, as much as we can. You know, at some point, you know, we, uh, you know, we, you got to start focusing on the on the on your your own your own stuff that your own data that you have to produce. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the general culture, we try to be as flat as possible. I see. I see. That makes good sense, um, especially again for a smaller studio. Um, is this sort of the type of job that you've always wanted to have like is did you have a fairly linear path um you know is this something that you wanted to be when you were a kid <laughs> or did you just you know sort of fall into this um and I, I guess that might that might tie into actually the story of how you came to found um red barrels itself but uh yeah do tell <laughs> well i uh, studied the uh, cinema at the university ah, okay uh and back in 1998 i was uh, looking for a job and uh, uh it was uh, I think it was my aunt uh, who told me uh, uh, she was working with the mother of uh, Patrice Desilets uh, at Ubisoft, who just opened uh, a few months before. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's kind of how I heard about the, the Ubisoft studio. And because of my studies, I, um, I decided to apply as a uh, scriptwriter. Cool. Uh, and back then, it was more like, uh, well, you know, sounds like a cool job to get. Uh, uh, me, meanwhile, uh, well, I tried to make movies happen. Right. right. Uh, so I, uh, I sent my resume and eventually I got called for an interview and they told me, well, we're not going to give you an interview as a script writer. We're going to give you an interview as a game designer. And I had to ask what the hell is a game designer? <laughs> I just had no idea uh, at all. And, um, and I did uh, a few interviews, and thankfully, there was in the lobby there was a few magazines I could read. To uh, <laughs> brush for, up, for example, yeah. Well, I, I gotta ask, you know, what what games are you uh, mostly uh, excited about? Most right. uh, upcoming <laughs> games are you most excited about? And I just read in the magazine, "To Rock Two is coming," so I just said, "Well, yeah, to Rock Naturally. Two." Naturally, <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. Maybe every candidate they interviewed just said that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the same <laughs> that's funny so they clearly saw something though in your your writing skills and and i guess your ability to script out that story um, well that it was mostly uh, uh i think back then you know uh, when ubisoft opened there was not a lot of people with experience in town right so they were hiring mostly based on the uh, potential and uh, in my case it was because of my studies as a in cinema to work on the third person camera in games. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, which, which is something I did on the sense of time and, uh, and also on uncharted when I moved to, uh, to LA to work at Naughty Dog. Right. Uh, so, I, so yeah, that's the, I got hired in 98, uh, stayed there at Ubisoft for seven, eight years. Then I went to Naughty Dog to work on a first uh, uncharted for a couple of years. I uh, came back to Montreal, back at Ubisoft, uh, for a few, more years and then went to EA Montreal where I joined uh, Hugo and David. We were working on a brand new IP which was uh, an original idea from Hugo hmm. and we worked on it for uh, about a year uh, until uh, for various reasons uh, and obviously not good reasons if you ask me but anyway for uh, <laughs> different various reasons uh, the, the, the project got cancelled uh -huh. and that's when we, de we decided that you know uh, maybe it was life's way to kick our, kick our butt and uh, get us uh, started on this uh, new venture interesting and that's something that i've heard from a lot of um <laughs> a lot of game developers and game designers uh who i would say are, are successful at this point in the industry they sort of come from this history of like some kind of unfortunate <laughs> um, maybe unfinished project or, or something that didn't quite come to fruition that pushed them a little bit further so that's that's really interesting um was yeah, that it's, it's also because you know when you, you become a senior uh in the big studios you you end up spending 
a lot more time in meeting rooms uh, talking about the game instead of being at your desk working on the game. And we, That's fair. we were all very hands-on kind of developers, so we wanted to go back focusing on working on the game and less uh, just talking about it for hours and hours in meeting rooms. Interesting. Uh, Interesting. Yeah. So was and, uh, the was that decision then to sort of step away from, you know, uh, I guess your your security and maybe like the familiarity, I guess, of the experience of working in a larger studio to start your own? Was that um, like a scary decision or was it sort of something that you were <laughs> ready to go uh, on a limb for? Well, you know, there was a lot of naivety, uh, uh, obviously, uh, when we uh, made, the, made the decisions. I, I initially thought that the, it would take us maybe three months to work on a pitch uh, and find out if we can get money or not for it. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we ended up, like, waiting 18 months uh, before we could uh, finally find some money. Oh, okay. uh, so we tried to uh, uh, get money from publishers, um, first parties uh that didn't work uh we tried the canada media found a first time uh, mm -hmm. uh it didn't work we had to apply a second time uh we couldn't find any money from vcs mm -hmm. uh really it's it's only after we uh we got the the money from the cmf after the second application that we were uh, finally a go right uh so that took 18 months uh and yeah especially after after the first time we um we got the uh, uh, we got a negative answer from the CMF. That's probably when it was uh, the hardest time because we had been working on this for a year without any uh, real salary. It's a lot of investment. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, 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 and we had to make the decision because applying to the CMF may, meant waiting maybe three, four months before we submit the application then waiting an additional two months before we get an answer. So uh, overall six months before we find out if it works or not this time mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so uh you know we, we took a while to uh, think about think about it uh, a few weeks but uh, eventually we decided to, to just uh, give it one more try and see what happens and it worked um i mean i guess yeah. that that <laughs> perseverance probably f felt rough at the time to sort of push through that but um I'm sure it gave you time also to refine some of what your plan was and how, you know, you would approach the studio. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Most of the, the working on the concept, when, when eventually, when we finally got the money and we were able to find us an office space and start hiring people, mm -hmm. uh, by then we had a very clear idea of what we uh, wanted to achieve and we were able to go straight into production. That's great. Uh, which is no... Uh, not usually what happens uh, even in a small studio like this you know, when you start a conception phase there's a lot of uh, people uh, around you uh, asking questions waiting for answer and you're not able to give them those answers right away so you got to find stuff that makes sense mm -hmm. uh, to get we can find all the answers that they need makes in a small studio uh, compared to big studios where usually they just have like one core team work on something until they're ready to have more people join and that's when the people from other uh, projects uh, come over right yeah that makes sense i guess um and were you at that point already focused on outlast as as your sort of initial project or did that sort of come after you were more secure in the studio itself <laughs> No, actually, we uh, after we left our jobs, we uh, quickly we made a list of projects we wanted to do, and uh, uh, making a horror game uh, was at the top of the list. Uh, I guess because it was um, at the same time a, a challenge because we never worked on a horror game before, oh. uh, but at the same time it kind of uses some of the main uh, uh, characteristics of an action adventure game, which mm -hmm. is what we had been working on up, up until uh, this point. Uh, so it was, it felt like a nice balance, you know. It would transfer, and, I imagine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You'd never know that you had never done a horror game before, though. Um, you guys must have, uh, yeah, you must, you must have some horror fans on your team at the very least. Um, because oh, yeah, Outlast yeah. is, they, yeah, it hits the right note, that's for sure. Well, David, one of the co-founders, uh, when we started, uh, was living in, a, in the loft. And uh, it's like we had uh, one full wall of just movies and games oh all cool all. <laughs> uh, okay <laughs> that explains a lot of it then yeah because the, the tonality i'm i'm a horror fan and and you know i'm 
someone who doesn't scare too easily and and the game is like a really nice experience um <laughs> that way but it's it's great that you guys were um sort of coming up with with sort of a title or i guess a flagship project even if you didn't know it at the time um alongside the founding of that studio so that that i'm sure would yeah. give you a little bit more confidence at least to push through because you have a project yeah, well, that you believe in yeah and actually i think it's uh, yeah, it, uh it's it, it happens often that or at least it was in our case that you know you you do a project before you actually worry about making the company. Yeah. So that's why very often you know you get that project out of the door, and then you realize well now the project is over. Uh, we actually have to take into consideration uh, <laughs> that before we you know that the first project was mostly like a sprint just to try to get it out of, of the door before uh, we run out of money. Yes. Uh, but once it was out of the door, you know there was stuff that we kind of set aside uh, because <laughs> we were like, well, let's think about that stuff uh, you know, when, when the project's done. And when the project is done, then all these things come back to you. Suddenly uh, to in your face. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And suddenly you're like, well, you know, as a company, we have to be thinking about this, this, and that. We have to do this, this, and that. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was a learning curve as well uh, for us because as game developers, we, we, we did not really experience in you know, managing a, a company. Interesting. Interesting. Well, I'm, I'm really glad that you guys made it through that initial perhaps struggle. <laughs> um, Outlast 2, um, which I haven't had a chance to check out really in detail, though I've seen it sort of played by other people, which is not the same thing at all. Um, would, would you say that that's, I think that the success of the first sort of warrants obviously creating another, but is that sort of a pattern that your studio intends to follow, um, where you have sort of multi-chapter titles? Um, Assuming that people want them. <laughs> uh, well, well, I guess I, I'll have to uh, sort of reiterate uh, uh, you know, what we uh, said on Facebook recently, which is that uh, you know we definitely are motivated to do an Outlast three game in the near future, but currently we're working on something uh, different. We're not sure, honestly, yet if it's going to work out. So uh, we have to wait a bit before we uh, uh, talk more about it. Uh, mm -hmm. But you know, we really, we really like doing horror games. But at the same time, uh, we we need different challenges. You know, we need to uh, stretch totally. different muscles. So uh, so I think uh, it's just a, a matter of trying to find the right balance uh, between the two. Understandable. What an elegant way of answering my question that you probably aren't allowed to answer. <laughs> and I think I asked it pretty elegantly, if I do say so myself. Um, but no, that, that's that's exciting to know that the possibility is on the table and also that you guys are exploring other um, other types of projects because I'd love to see what this type of talent and, and I guess style um, sensibility does when it's applied to another genre. Um, that would be really cool. I guess um, I'm interested to know if there's any game not created by your studio team um, that's left sort of a um, maybe a significant um, either impact from like a memorability standpoint or maybe an emotional standpoint but is there any game that sort of resonates with you personally that that sort of stands out well personally I mean obviously uh, you know, they, they, yeah we have a group there of very different people so with different tastes so uh, answers would vary a lot yes but, I'm uh, sure. <laughs> uh, Personally, uh, in the last uh, couple of years, I uh, I really enjoyed Journey and Firewatch. Nice, nice. Which yeah, is I really enjoyed those uh, experiences. Yeah, and it's interesting that you use the word experience because that's yeah pretty apropos for those games. Um, yeah, I think you know, we know we use the term video game a lot, but actually it's not. It it kind of uh, comes with a certain definition that doesn't doesn't work anymore with all the different kind of. Uh, uh, interactive experiences that's uh, that's been uh, that's been released. So mm -hmm. I don't know if at some point there will there will be a new vocab vocabulary to mm -hmm. uh, uh, talk about the, the world of interactive experiences. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, I think in those in the, in the, in the uh, for games, uh, video game doesn't feel like the right way to approach it. Yeah. That's very true. Yeah, it's, it's sort of grown outside of that box and <laughs> doesn't fit anymore. <laughs> Interesting. Um, well, I mean, it's 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 it still fits, but you know, it's it's just like anyway. That's me. Me, I, I try. I even when you think about Outlast, I try to come approach it as more an interactive experience than right. uh, as video game. Especially that in case of horror games in general, 
uh, there's a lot of things here that you have to do differently than the than the, than a traditional action adventure game. That's very uh, true. For example, uh, in the traditional game, you want to feel your player empowered and you know new mechanics and tools and mechanics. But in an horror game, there's a bit a bit of that, but you don't want the player to reach a point where they feel so comfortable that you know they they are the master of their of the game world. That's right. And uh, <laughs> that, that's 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 also tied to the why we left the uh, the asylum mm -hmm. uh, after uh, the DLC whistleblower because we mm -hmm. people were feeling a little bit too comfortable in the asylum, like it felt like a uh, uh, a known place uh, they were familiar with. Ah, okay. So uh, we felt like we, uh, we we needed to bring players into a new so that they can uh, uh, you know start a game with uh, lots of questions and doubts about what's coming next. Oh, interesting. That's uh, absolutely brilliant and very effective. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think as a player, too, it's nice to, to think about um, how some of these experiences are being planned and designed to keep you on your toes, um, especially in, in the case of the horror genre, but any game, really. It's um, it's nice when, especially a, a you know, follow-up title feels fresh and different and can still inspire the original feelings that you had. Um, so for those who might be tuning in just now or not aware of what we're talking about, Outlast is the name of this game. <laughs> Please go check it out. Um, Outlast 2, I gather. Uh, when did when was Outlast 2 released? Has it been a while? Uh, April 4. Oh, okay. So, yes, absolutely something that you can go pick up and easily find. Um, are there any yeah. games... Um, are there any games that are out right now um, that you're looking forward to trying or that have sort of piqued your interest or might be sitting on your radar at all? Uh, well, generally, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm a uh, Call of Duty whore. Oh, nice. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Says I mean, it all. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my fix, like, uh, well, after supper, I need to sit down for like half an hour, 45 minutes to get my Call of Excellent. Duty fix. So that's that's... <laughs> That's, I mean, I, so I, what I'm playing is just, it's become so part of my routine that I just, yeah. I, I just, I need to play it, you know? <laughs> I don't have to justify it. I'm like that with Rocket League now. So it's, there's always those games okay. that you kind of return to. Well, that and I picked up Cuphead and I'm kind of like addicted to getting better at it. so hard. Um, <laughs> switching gears a little bit. Um, is there anyone in the industry? I imagine your co-founders are, are sort of mentor type figures, um, you know, um, in your life. But is there anyone else in the games industry who you would consider to be a sort of a role model or, or just someone that you would look up to? Uh, well, I mean, I really enjoyed my time working at Naughty Dog and, uh, uh, I really uh, enjoyed working with uh, Neil Druckmann and yeah. uh, Bruce Trailing. And now that Bruce is, uh, uh, has left uh, Naughty Dog, I'm really eager, uh, curious to see what he's going to do next. Ah, interesting. Uh, and, uh, I, uh, you know, I, we talk now and then, but I haven't talked to him since he made the move, so I... Uh, I don't have scoops. <laughs> no, no problem. We'll we'll have to keep our ear to the ground. That's all. Um, but no, Naughty Dog is such a great studio. They put out some great stuff. Um, I guess um, you know, there's we've talked a little bit about um, you know how games and and sort of that mold that they used to fit into has sort of been broken, and now um, there's this plethora of interactive experiences that um, game devs are all working on. Um, is that sort of the biggest change that you've seen in games since you know you first joined the industry or is there some other um change or you know evolution that you've seen happen that you might put your finger on in the last five or six years well definitely for us the biggest the biggest change has been the uh democratization of the uh of the market by uh, allowing right. people to reach the audience more directly uh this, this, I think, uh, a lot of games have come out in the last few years because, uh, because of that. Games right. that uh, would have never been made in big studios, uh, and especially in the origin. I think the origin has been uh, kept alive uh, mm -hmm. by uh, indie companies uh, because it didn't necessarily make sense for big studios to uh, do that kind of game. Totally. Uh, it's, it's, and, and it's the same. You see the same thing in movies. Uh, you, know, you wouldn't see a movie studio like. Put the hundred million dollars uh, on a uh, horror uh, movie. Mm -hmm. 
you see smaller studios doing horror movies with smaller budgets uh, because they know they they might they will most likely not make the revenues of an av avatar. Uh, yeah movie. something safer but, yeah. <laughs> yeah but but you know if they make something good then it's def definitely a, a, a fan base that uh, that's going to be there for 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 the movie and i think totally. it's the same kind of thing uh in the video game uh you know you, you you may not make the same kind of you may not make the same kind of revenue with the horror game than you would with a call of duty grand theft auto red dead redemption assassin's creed uh, but you know, if you make a decent one, there's definitely a, a, a fan base that will allow you to uh, uh, make it uh, make it uh, make, make make sense of it uh, fa financially. Absolutely, uh, yeah. No, that's uh, that's very astute. And and is that something that you feel is a matter of there being more opportunity and access to the tools that you need to make games, or is that a matter of the industry being more accepting of smaller studios, sort of having their share in the market? Um, well, I think it's a, uh, it's, um, it's uh, being able. I mean, the the fact that, that yes, uh, the, the the tools out there are, can can be accessed by, uh, accessible uh, for almost anybody. Like for example, you can use the Unreal Engine uh, for uh, for free mm -hmm. and you know try to work on something. And then if you release something, then yes, there will be some financial financial terms. But uh, at, at least you know the tool is there for you to work on, on something, something and try it out, and then being able to release it without having to go through uh, uh, an additional party. I mean, right. obviously, it would, it's it's you know, it's awesome if your game is released on Steam, but technically, you could just put it on a website and people could access your access your game. That's so true. So I think it's, uh, that's a that's a, a, fu a fundamental change in the business model uh, in the, uh, the of the last few years. Interesting. Um, and something that actually a few devs that I've spoken with have pointed out is both a, a blessing and a curse to the industry, um, in a sense. So yes, lots more being made, but you know, lots more being started and maybe yeah. unfinished. <laughs> um, so as you said, yeah. there's a there's a challenge to sort of having a sustainable um, studio, obviously, and, and even project in and of itself. Um, I guess. Yeah, and uh, the, the landscape, even even in our game, the landscape has changed a lot you know, between Outlast One and Outlast Two. And when we released Outlast One, it was mostly in the studios uh, who were uh, working on horror games. But mm -hmm. by the time we released Outlast Two, uh, big studios uh, were doing a, a comeback. So oh, with okay. Evil Within, uh, Alien Isolation, and uh, Resident Evil Seven, who came out like three months before Outlast Some Two. Tough competition. So, uh, <laughs> Yeah, it was it was that the landscape uh, was completely uh, completely different. Uh, I mean, we'll see what happens in the next few years. I, I know, for the reasons I explained earlier, that for for example, I read Alien Isolation, although uh, you know it, it's it sold a good number of co copies, made mm -hmm. some good money. Uh, it was maybe not enough to make sense uh, financially to uh, do a sequel because yeah. it was coming from a much bigger company with a, a lot more overhead and all that. Yeah. So. That's so yeah, I, I I I couldn't I couldn't say about Evil Within and uh, Resident Evil, but I guess no fear if there's this there was a second Evil Within, and then it's because they, they were able to make uh, find a way to make it uh, to, to make sense of a, the business model. Right. Yeah, but financial viability comes first, basically. Yeah, yeah. and Alien <laughs> Isolation is such a good game. Like that's one that yeah, if you could have called it one horror game that I loved. Oh goodness, um, and a tough one too. Uh, this has been really awesome. I, I've learned so it's funny cause I heard, I've heard you speak, so I wasn't sure, you know, how much more could you possibly have to teach me? I'm kidding. <laughs> um, but I've, I've learned a lot, um, especially about sort of how Red Barrels came to be. Um, so thank you. I guess as a, as a final question, and this is always. Oh, I lost, I lost the sound. I'm not hearing you now. Testing, testing, testing. Oh, hey, hey. <laughs> yes. Wow, plagued by issues today. Happy 2018. <laughs> <laughs> Wireless headphones are amazing the until they. Yeah, dog, <laughs> and then battery dying. Um, 
Apologies, Philippe. Um, so let me recompose that final question. Um, but this is one that, that I find uh, people always have a little bit of a tough time um, either answering easily or um, <laughs> answering, I guess, with a little bit of pain. But I'm curious, you know, if you were to give yourself um, advice, uh, yourself 10 years ago, um, and, you know, basically from the perspective of someone who wants to be in your shoes but doesn't really know how to get there, doesn't know how to get started, um, what advice would you give to someone who wants to have a role like yours in the industry? Oh, boy. <laughs> no pressure. Well, I can, let me start by maybe uh, if I was giving myself uh, advice, but that probably would apply to uh, a lot of people, but uh, in my enough. case, uh, <laughs> it was like, a, like I was saying earlier, I, when I started Ubisoft, I was uh, coming from the uh, uh, movie business, uh, trying to make movies. And it took uh, many, many years before I, uh, uh, I made peace with the fact that uh, making games uh, will be my life. Right. And, uh, <laughs> I should just forget about this whole movie thing. Uh, so I would tell, give myself the uh, the uh, the advice of of dropping the, <laughs> the idea of making movies and just focus on uh, on making games. Uh, just because I, I lost uh, maybe uh, some some energy there, uh, trying to work both at the same time, you know, day job and work on scripts at night. And right. Make stuff happens. Uh, and the other one would be uh, when I we started this. Uh, uh, New uh, game studio uh, adventure. Uh, we first tried to make it happen uh, without uh, putting our own money mm, in it. Okay. And what ended up being the um, the, uh, the solution that made the studio happen was actually something that was accessible right from the start. But because we were trying to, you know, find publishers and have other people put money in it. Uh, we, it, it took like a year before we got back to this scenario that was already there from the start. So mm -hmm. basically what I'm saying is that it would have been able to make the studio uh, a reality uh, within six months instead of a year and a half. I see. If we had focused right away on saying, you know, it's uh, we got to put skin in the game and yes, put the, our, uh, you know, put our uh, credit, mar credit margins and uh, take out our AI and uh, all that stuff. And uh, uh, yeah, it would have been we would have been able to save a year uh, if we had known right from the start that know this, this, this that was the way to go. <laughs> I see, yeah, and that's and that's a tough sometimes reality to come to because it is it is sort of going all in in a sense. Um, yeah, and you Absolutely. know, and as you said, all in after coming from relative security and you know high level experience. So yours is a really interesting story, um, and I, I'm really glad to hear, you know, that Red Barrels is sort of rolling along, forgive the pun, <laughs> with uh, with a new project. I, I would love to hear more about it when you guys are ready. I know you've probably got it cooking, um, you know, it's still in the oven. So we'll let it, we'll let it go for now. Um, but thank you so much, Philippe. This is, like I said, it's been really insightful. I've learned a lot and I think that you've given some really good, um, you know, real talk about how, you know, people come to be in the industry and how some of the hard decisions around starting a studio are made. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks to you. Absolutely. Um, for anyone who uh, has stuck with us through the technical difficulties, thank you. Um, <laughs> but if you did tune in partway through, uh, we will always have our full videos up. Um, they are available on twitch.tv slash gamedevcafe for a short time. Uh, but you can also find the edited version uh, at youtube.com slash gamedevcafe or, of course, on gamedevcafe.com. My name is Karina. We've been chatting with Philippe Morin of Red Barrels. Thank you very much for watching and take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>